Good evening and welcome to this regular session uh, meeting of the Nacogdoches Independent School District Board of Trustees. Um, let the record show that a quorum of the board members is present and that notice of this meeting has been legally posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meeting Act. Um, please remember that items do not have to be taken in the order shown on the agenda and join us in turning cell phones to some type of silent mode. The board will now conduct an executive closed session to discuss the items posted on our agenda pursuant to the following provisions of the Texas Open Meeting Act and as allowed by Texas Government Code Sections 551.071, 551.072, 551.073, 551.129. No voting will take place in closed meeting. Any action the board wishes to take as a result of discussions in closed session will take place after the board reconvenes in open session. It's now 5.02. Semi-professional.
<clears throat> the board is now reconvening into open session. The time is now six o'clock. We're going to call on um, Mr. Smith um, to give us our invocation. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful spring day, the opportunity to come together and do the business of this district. We ask that you guide us, and direct us to do what's in the best interest of the school district, its students, teachers, employees, and the community as we come together and try to make positive changes. We ask that you be with the sick and the afflicted, the handicapped and the crippled, and the ones who are in sorrow and need at this time. Go and be with us throughout this meeting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Ms. Moore is going to come with our crew from Carpenter for our, our flags. Good evening, Mem uh, President Irvin, Superintendent Frazier. Uh, Frazier? Fra Frazier. Frazier. I'm sorry. <laughs> and members of the Board of Trustees, I am here tonight to present to you our leaders from Carpenter Elementary School. They're also UIL participants, and their sponsor, Mrs. Lindsay Taylor is here and she'll allow them to introduce themselves. They are preparing to lead us in the pledge. My name is Emmanuel Shai, and I'm in third grade. My name is Algerian Scott, and I'm in third grade. My name is Ari, and I'm in fourth grade. My name is Diamond Poo, and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Benicio Whitaker, and I'm in fifth grade. My name is Erica Green, and I am in fourth grade. My name is Araya Swindle, and I am in fourth grade. Not Miss Taylor, I'm the librarian. You guys see what we are in the board book? You see what we are in the board book? We got one action item. Very much. Nice job. <laughs> Before we move to the action agenda, we do have one action item for consideration. At this time, we want to take an action on the approval of the interim superintendent's contract at this time. Mr. President? Yes. A motion. I move the board approve the interim superintendent contract as presented. Second. It has been moved by Mr. Neal and second by Mr. Matoya that we would approve the superintendent's contract as presented. Um, is there any discussion? All in favor will show by the U sign the vote. Mm -hmm. The vote is unanimous. The motion is carried. Thank, so. Thank you. All right. We'll go now to recognition. Good evening, uh, President Irvin, board members, interim superintendent Fraley.
Tonight we have two of our Nacogdoches High School swimmers with us, Jackson Castleberry and Jesse Stovall. And Jackson and Jesse, why don't you head up this way? Carrie Scroggins, their coach. I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to do that again in just a moment as well. Carrie Scroggins, their coach, could not make it tonight. She's at the soccer playoff game being held out of town. But her assistant coach, Chris Moody, is here. Coach Moody, why don't you come on up too? The Nacogdoches High School swim team had a fantastic season. They sent 31 swimmers to the regional meet with Jackson and Jesse earning berths in the state swim meet. Jesse, who is a senior this year, and I don't know that I get to say this very often in my career, but she is a UIL state champion swimmer. Wow. There you go. There's one. Awesome. Jesse won the 50 yard freestyle and finished second in the 100 freestyle and in the process set school records in both races. Jackson, who's a sophomore at NHS, finished 10th overall in the 100-yard freestyle after beginning the meet seated 22nd. Jesse has been named first team All-State in the 50 and 100 freestyle races, and Jackson is second team All-State in the 50 backstroke and honorable mention All-State in the 100 freestyle and 100 backstroke. Earlier this month, Jesse signed a letter of intent to swim for Southwestern University in Georgetown beginning next year. These are wonderful accomplishments by wonderful students at NHS in a fine program, and join me once more in saluting their success. Thank you all very much. All right, um, March is Social Worker Appreciation Month, and I'd like Lauren Ivy Seja, Nacogdoches ISD social worker, to come up here, and uh, she's going to uh, talk a little bit about the social worker program, and she's going to mention more about this as well. But just last weekend, the NISD social workers were honored by the Texas Experiential Resource Association with the program of the year in the state of Texas. Wow. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and speak with you about our program. Um, so, let's see how this goes, okay. So like Les said, my name's Lauren Ivy Seja. Um, I'm the social worker that serves the McMichael feeder pattern. Um, so that includes McMichael, Carpenter, Brooks, Quinn, and Fredonia. Um, a few of our other social workers are here today. There's Katie Munguia, she's got a baby with her. Um, she is the Texas Title I Priority Schools uh, TTIP social worker at Fredonia. Um, Eddie Harwell, he serves the Moses feeder pattern, so that includes Regay, Nettie, and TJR. And we have Ruby Ramon, who um, serves NHS and Malcolm Rector and our uh, team pregnancy and parenting program. And then Winnie Tome, who is the who was hired, hired under the T Tips grant at Carpenter. Um, so. Um, I know a lot of you have probably seen this iceberg thing used as a metaphor, um, but it really en like encompasses what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so a lot of times, um, so you know, the iceberg, you can see the small part, but the majority of it's under the water. You don't know how big it is um, until you actually go and look. Um, and a lot of times we get uh, referrals. We're asked to talk to students or families about something because something's happening. You know, a student is dirty, or they have poor hygiene, or they're sleeping in class, or I don't know. They're they when they're given an assignment, they freak out, um, and so somebody sees that and they say something's going on. Can you talk to them? Can you talk to the parent? And once we actually start talking to the parent or to the student, we sort of start finding out all of these things that are under the surface. So 
Maybe they don't have electricity or water. Maybe they don't have a bed. Um, maybe they have an undiagnosed learning problem. Maybe they just don't want to take a shower. <laughs> that happens too. Um, and so, so we start seeing all of these things. Um, and so when those, ha when those things come up, like what do we do? Um, as social workers, we were this link between the student, the family, the school, and the community. Um, and it's our goal and our job um, to make sure, to help families reduce those barriers so that students can be successful in school. Um, and so sometimes that's helping students talk to their parents about something. <coughs> sometimes that's helping them talk to teachers or principals about something. Um, sometimes that's about helping them, the family access community resources or the family talk to the school about something um, or help community agencies work with a school in a way that is effective um, so that we can serve our students in the best way possible. Um, so as of March 1st, um, the social work program, uh, 1,025 students have received social work services in our district. We have about 6,300 students in our district, so that's close to one in six students. Um, and when I say students, I mean students and families. So sometimes we're working with a family, and sometimes we're working with a student, sometimes we work with both. Um, 306 students receive ongoing services with social workers, so that's um, services more than three times in a month. Um, and that's for all five of us. And then as of March 1st, we had 127 students receiving homeless support services. Um, and as of last week, that number had jumped up to 144. So, um, and those are pretty critical cases that we spend a lot of time on. And this is just a sample um, of some of our data. We collect a lot of data. Um, these are the kinds of interventions that we do. So these are the things that we do um, to help those students. Um, and this is the high school and the McMichael feeder pattern data. Um, but community referrals are when we give parents or students referrals to community for like basic needs, mental health, medical services, pretty much anything you could think of. Um, a crisis intervention would be that we are in intervening, you know, um, if a student says like, I don't have anywhere to go tonight, or um, they make a, an outcry that they wanna hurt themselves, or um, if a student dies, or they lose a loved one. Um, that would be crisis intervention. Educational support is really things around RTI, special education, 504, um, monitoring grades, and those sorts of things. Family support would be um, us connecting parents, um, like helping them arrange transportation, applying for public benefits, um, those sorts of things, or like being the liaison between the community and the family. Um, individual support is those individual things like helping students with coping skills or bullying or mediation, which is something that I do a lot at the middle school. Um, those individual things. And then student needs are actual things that you give to students like clothing, hygiene items, or families, but clothing, hygiene items, backpacks, um, stuff like that. And then um, it's our goal, I mean, it's inherent in our job that we um, have to know about resources and be involved in the community. Um, and so you'll oftentimes see us out in the community, out in neighborhoods doing things. And these are just some examples of things that we do. Um, also, uh, Eddie, Winnie, and Katie lead parenting classes for our parents in our school district. Um, and so these are some of the pictures from those. And then um, we work with businesses, businesses in our community and nonprofits are super generous and they give us a lot of things for our students. Um, and then we also provide presentations to different agencies in the community about <coughs> students' rights um, within the school district so that those agencies work with us um, in meeting the needs of our kids. And then finally, um, we have a social work wall right around the corner across from bathrooms. This is a, an activity that we do every year with our students and families. Um, this year our theme was Leaders, Advocates, Champions. Um, and so we um, asked students and families and colleagues to let us know how a, a social worker has been a leader, an advocate, or a champion for them. Um, this also provides more information about the services that we provide. Um, and then I was just gonna mention the award that we won. It's um, such a great honor to be um, 
to win that award. And we also, we're going to, I guess we're getting a plaque, but there's also this big drum that comes with it. And it's like probably bigger than this, I think, um, that we could get to use with students. Um, Eddie Harwell, he's not here, but he has more information about that. Um, and then finally, um, this is just, these are our email addresses and the campuses where we work. And then if there are parents here or parents listening, um, if you want to talk to a school social worker, just contact the campus where your student goes to school, um, and the campus will connect you with us. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, just a second, Les, before we move forward. Mr. Matar, you had a comment you'd like to make? Well, I, I just want to say most of you know that I'm also a social worker, and I was a school social worker at NISD for 13 years. And I loved my job because it gave me an opportunity to help teachers, to help kids, to help staff, and to help other professionals in the district to work together for, to meet the needs of these kids. These social workers do that. I'm very proud of them because that award that they get tells you that they're sincere about what they're doing, and I'm a strong proponent about social workers in schools. I would like to see us all have one in each one of the schools, but I know sometimes we can't do it financially, but it would save us a lot of grief when we're dealing with families and kids. So thanks for the hard work, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, Lauren, could I get you guys to come up here so we could get a picture of y'all? Just, just before she, she do, I, I was going to mention that Mr. Matoya last night was recognized as the Social Worker of the Year as well. All right. Great. Come on, Mr. Matoya, come down and take a picture with our social worker. Social worker. Thank you guys. And Lauren, let me know when the drum gets here. I want to get a picture of you guys with it. <laughs> Over the next several months, we're going to be recognizing contributions of the many volunteers who help out around our school district. Thomas J. Rusk Elementary Principal Paula Harshbarger is on hand tonight to talk about some of the volunteers at her campus. Ms. Harshbarger, would you come on up here, please? Good evening, Good evening. President Irvin, Superintendent Fraley, and Board of Trustees. We have so many volunteers and mentors that work with us at TJR, and it is my absolute honor to be able to recognize these two groups of people tonight. Um, the first is Kids Hope USA, so if you guys want to start coming up, we have Jane Ann Bridges, Kim Dean, Linda Green, Steve Green, <laughs> Lori McCrary, Linda Parrish, and Jack Windham. Kids Hope USA is a mentoring program that's sponsored by the First Christian Church. And they have no agenda, they have no expectations, they just show up. They show up to work with our kids, they read with them, they play games with them, they check in on their behavior, and um, they are a vital part of our campus and have such a huge impact on our student achievement. And um, we just want to thank you so much for all that you do. Um, you're absolutely, positively um, the heartbeat of our campus, and we really appreciate you. So thank you. Thank 
Thank you guys. That's great. Thank you. Y'all just stay. Great teacher. Yeah, we have we're gonna get a picture with our first second person. You know teachers, we like to expedite things. <laughs> okay. The second person that we get to honor tonight is a one-man show, um, Mr. Joe Spencer. I would like to say that Mr. Spencer got dressed up tonight, but he didn't. This is how Mr. Spencer comes to work every day. <laughs> at an event one time when they were trying to encourage people to be mentors for kids and they wanted them to just sign up for 30 minutes a week and I laughed because Mr. Spencer comes every day. He doesn't get paid. He comes every day um, from 8 to 3.30 just like he is now. Um, he works with our librarian. Um, he works with our literacy circles. He's worked with our ELL kiddos. Um, he shelves books. He checks out books. Um, there's just not a lot he doesn't do. And um, we are just tickled pink to be able to honor him tonight. He's a former employee of Nacogdoches ISD who's giving back to the school district. And we just feel super fortunate to be able to work with him. So thank you, Mr. Spencer. President Eric, if I may. Yes, sir. Um, I want us to recognize just how important the volunteers are. You know, every school system is going to have brick and mortar, quality teachers, quality students, and, and folks like that. But the real secret sauce, the real secret sauce are our volunteers. So thank you for what you guys do. It's amazing what you add to our product line. Thank you so much. Thank you. OK, I have one final thing tonight, then you'll be rid of me for the rest of the evening. Today, we got to do something that was really fun, almost as fun as uh, introducing a state champion. We went out and recognized the two district teachers of the year for Nacogdoches ISD. For uh, this elementary grades, it's Kylie Altier of BQJ. And for uh, secondary, it's Jody Franks at Mike Moses. And th this was just a wonderful time. We, we took some flowers out to them and uh, broke the news. It was a surprise. <laughs> and uh, the, the pr both principals uh, helped us out with that. But next month, we're going to have all of our teachers of the year here at the uh, board meeting, the campus level, and of course then uh, Miss Altier and Miss Franks. But we just wanted to mention that to you as well, mainly because it's up on our website right now. <laughs> but uh, th that was a wonderful thing, and we look forward to having them here next month. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We now come to the information item and report segment of tonight's meeting. <clears throat> and we'll begin with our interim superintendent, Mr. Freeman. Thank you, uh, President Irvin, trustees. Uh, this has been a great first two weeks here in Echo Society. I've met some great staff, uh, students, uh, principals. We had a great meeting last week. I was on campus th three schools this morning uh, and this afternoon and, and just really uh, am very optimistic about what we can do here. Uh, this is the busiest time of the year of the school year, that is. And we have about 10 weeks left. You're going to have games, end of your parties, uh, 
and banquets. So get your, get ready for the chicken circuit. Um, and uh, this little thing called Star is going to happen uh, uh, in April and to the end of May, and we'll be fine. We'll be fine. Um, and we're very happy to recognize our soccer team. Boys and girls both did well at regional. They're playing tonight as we speak. Uh, the girls are playing uh, at Bryan High School, uh, playing Bryan High School at Texas A&M University. And the boys are playing in Waco High in Athens. And the Lady Dragons finished third in uh, District 17-5A. And boys team finished second in districts. So we're very proud of their success. Hope they go far, far into the playoffs there. And uh, our STEAM team took its first trip to the Texas State uh, Science Fair over this past weekend. And earlier this month, uh, four STEM students from Actors High School took home five specialty awards, and one team placed third in the senior fiscal uh, division during the competition in Kilgore. Uh, this is the first STEM Academy graduating class from NHS. We're very proud to have a partnership with uh, Stephen Boston State University. I'm talking about those folks. And we're very happy to bring real world, exper real world experiences with our students there. Uh, and finally, um, no school tomorrow. <laughs> it's a good Friday. Uh, but on Monday, there will be no classes for the students, but staff, we have to come to work. And it's not my fault. <laughs> this was a snowstorm, snow day you had back in January. So we'll see you all on Monday, and all enjoy your, your, your holy weekend. Thank you. Thank you. It's Friday. Ms. Uh, Kinsley, review of curriculum-based assessment data. Good evening. President Irvin, board members, Superintendent Fraley. Uh, tonight, our, uh, for the Lone Star Governance, our, uh, the goal we are looking at is goal 2.3, the gap between the percentage of district students served through special education and the percentage for all district students who demonstrate proficiency on or above on curriculum-based assessments for reading will decrease from 29% to 17% by the end of 2021. So we have a targeted improvement goal that we have set for the district to increase state assessment passing rates for students served in special education to 60% or more in all subject areas and students served in K, LEP, ESSA, social studies to 75% or more in all subject areas. And all campuses will complete ART and LRE training. So these, this is one of our very special targeted groups. Uh, it is a, a group of students that you hear a lot about in the state. And I'm going to show you how we compare with the state. And we've been working very hard to create a plan that will help them be successful. So when we set our goals, we had short-term goals, we had intermediate goals, and, and our long-term are the results we're hoping to, to get. Um, so we started off with differentiation and accommodation training at all the campuses. Um, the intermediate goal for that was collaborative planning and PLCs. And I would like to say that we feel like the PLCs have been very productive in helping the special ed teachers learn the rigor of the TEKS and working collaboratively uh, this year more than ever before with the general ed teachers. So tier one instruction was based on the rigorous TEKS based lessons and our long term goal would be that the data will be used to target interventions and monitor student progress. Uh, we also did training on DMAC, and we created special monitoring groups in DMAC for our Kate students, our SPED, and our LEP students. And these are also part of what we call the PBMAS that we've had to uh, report to the state. The results of the benchmark STAR test are being used to determine the student intervention goals. We focused a lot on vocabulary, not just with these, this special group of students, but with all of our students. The academic vocabulary we've been working on uh, at all all grades and all campuses. And then we set up campus trainings and special ed uh, leaders came in and they provided accommodations and modifications and trained the teachers on how to help special ed students be more successful in the classroom. So the first look at the data, and I'm gonna go, this, the line that goes across, that's where the state is, 37% of the students, that's, that was their, their goal for special education students. So you see we're lacking. The numbers are there because it's sort of deceiving from grade to grade on how many numbers of special ed students that you might have. So in third grade, as the district, we only had 36 students and then we had eight that met the standard. But I would like to share, and I'm not gonna stay on these graphs as much as this one, because this shows us, um, if I had to come up with a motto that distinguish this year for all of our students is pride and progress. And um, we can't expect to jump up to the very top 
we need to make our gradual increments. And you can see right here, these are our third graders and we compared, they don't have a state assessment to compare to. So compared to CBA 2 to the benchmark, you can see the growth that those students have made. So overall, our students, 52% of our SPED students have either made expected growth or accelerated growth. So that's a way that teachers can, students can celebrate, uh, celebrate their success of, of moving up. Here's our math. The, the benchmark was a little bit higher in math than reading. Um, and you can see how the, the small numbers make it really hard to look at. But if I come to this slide here, once again, we're comparing CBA 2 to the benchmark. You can see that students made either expected growth or accelerated growth. And as a district, we made 45% of our students uh, made growth. So the fourth grade uh, reading, uh, now, we're, now we have something to compare to because they took a third grade reading. So on this slide, this was this year's benchmark test. And uh, you can see we're getting our, you know, it's a little bit up and down depending on the different levels. Uh, and special education includes all a lot of different types of students in there. So it's sort of hard when you look at them as one big group. But once again, from third grade star compared to this fourth grade benchmark, we have made 62% growth with either expected or accelerated growth. So we're excited to see that those students are uh, making progress. Fourth grade benchmark. And um, we're making gains in math. Math is a little bit more concrete than the reading for some of our students. And this is comparing the third grade test last year to our fourth graders. So these are the same kids. So the kids that tested in third grade, now they're fourth graders. 30% um, of the students made either expected growth or accelerated growth. And when we think about the benchmark, it, Benchmark testing has been happening quite a bit, but that's driving our reviews, our interventions, our tutoring, our goal setting, both for the students and for the teachers. And so it's helping us get down to uh, the student level on who really needs to focus on which, which teaks. Then we have our writing, and you know, we have last year one special education student at Netty, and that's why that graph looks a little bit distorted. Uh, if you notice that the state, only 23% of the student, that's the average that uh, they have expected to pass that writing test because of the difficulty of the test. And we don't have a writing test to compare to from last year. This is compared to the CBA to the benchmark. Uh, this is one of the harder tests. The grammar is very hard for students, especially if they're struggling in reading. It's hard for them to translate those skills to, uh, gram to the grammar test. Our fifth grade. So this is, uh, once again, if you look, we're, we're exceeding the state baseline in a few of the campuses. And then we compared fifth grade to last year's fourth graders that took the test. And we have 46% uh, of the students are making expected or accelerated growth. And so it's nice to see on this one, the accelerated growth outweighs the expected growth. And now we're on the fifth grade SPED. Um, this is compared to the last year's fourth grade test. And we are really excelling in math in fifth grade, uh, as you saw in some of the general tests we've seen this year. But 65% of our students uh, have made accelerated growth with 80% expected growth. So th that's an amazing feat right there. We would love all of our slides to look just like that one. And then we have our seventh grade writing benchmark. Once again, they didn't take a, uh, a test last year in writing, so we don't have that comparison to compare. But this is how we did on this uh, most current. And that 18% there is the state uh, benchmark. That's the average there. So the writing is improving with 65% of the students either making expected growth or accelerated growth. And then we get to the eighth grade reading test. We can compare that to last year's seventh grade reading test. Uh, this te eighth grade reading uh, and math and fifth grade reading and math are coming up week after next, as well as the uh, seventh and fourth grade writing test. 
So even though it's small numbers of students, it's a very important group of students who we want to be successful in school. Here's our eighth grade math. Um, and then we compared it to last year's. So the benchmark, and we've got to take into account when they take the benchmark, they still have about seven to eight weeks of school. They haven't really gotten into the whole review section. So we're very hopeful that these kids will continue to make growth. Okay, our high school, our high school is a little bit different due to a couple of variables and I will go over. Uh, so if you look at that, line goes a little bit wacky there, uh, but the state, only 14% uh, passed the English 1 test last year for the whole state. Um, you can see the benchmark for algebra was 42%, biology 48, and then 60% for history. So if we look at this one here, um, we are seeing that our students are making growth between English 1 and to English 2. So we, they're, 59% of our students made progress with that. Okay, so let me come back to here. And then um, I would like to say that I would like to commend uh, Kayla Hughes is here and some of her teachers, because they have worked really, really hard this year uh, to get out to the campuses and really work with the teachers and work with the principals and, and create a plan that could uh, facilitate growth. So thank you very much, Kayla. Any of your te teachers here with you? We appreciate that. So I sent you a whole, whole lot of data, even though that was the special education goal was what we were supposed to cover. I sent you a lot of data because this is that time of year we're taking our benchmark. I'm not going to go over all that data, but I am going to give you a quick summary uh, so that you can see how we're comparing with all of our students compared to uh, the benchmark compared to the STAR test last year. So remember, uh, this is third through fifth grade, and we can't compare third graders to the test last year because they didn't take one. But you can see, and uh, if you look at 16, 17, when they took the benchmark, 49% of our third graders met the standard. On the STAR test, they increased by 55%. So if we're looking at a pattern like that, we can make a projection that third grade reading has gone up 4% since last year, so hopefully we're, and we are very intentional about instruction. We're hoping we'll exceed more than that. Fourth grade made 11% gain. So if we did that, we're hoping that's going to translate into 11% gain on the STAR test. Uh, fifth grade has made a 13% gain in reading, and um, we're hoping that's going to continue. And then writing, even though it looks stagnant, we have great hopes. It's, the writing test is just very hard for our students, and they haven't had as much practice as they have for the reading and math. But this benchmark data is really important because uh, we've really been mixing it up and trying to make uh, tutoring fun, do activities that are fun for the kids, not just the same old drill and kill. And this is important because we're looking at each individual student, each teacher's looking at their student and say, okay, this student really got it. What do we need to do a little bit differently for this group? And that might make Saturday camp different. It might make after school different. Some of the teachers are mixing the kids up between their classrooms. There's just a lot of different things happening right now to help students be successful. That's a very exciting chart right there. <laughs> it is. And wait till you see the math. It is exciting. You know, we know, we know in Nacogdoches that our kids lost out on a good foundation in reading and it struggles. But um, like I said, pride and progress is what we're after. This is the math benchmarks. We went up 18% over last year in third grade math. We've gone up 22% in fourth grade math and we've gone up 26% in fifth grade math. Wow. So we are truly hoping that these will show up when we get to the STAR test and uh, we will match that. It'll mirror that, we're hoping. That's, a, that's, our, that's what we're working towards. And in your data that you received, you have all the breakdown by the campuses and you can go back and look at each of the individual campuses and look at that. <coughs> and sixth to eighth grade reading, uh, once again, we're just, we've got this reading is just, we're struggling to keep our reading going and working on the stamina. And the test is really long and the kids get tired and they do well on the first couple of passages and then they get to the fourth and fifth passages and they think, oh, I'm a little tired. I don't think I'm gonna try as hard. So we have to keep working on the stamina of our kids. But sixth grade went up 4%, seventh grade's gone up 6% and eighth grade stayed stagnant. 
Now, eighth graders have two, three opportunities to take the test. The first two are the ones that count for countability, but uh, we are, uh, we've got some great things going on right now. Then we get to sixth and eighth grade math. Uh, these, this data is incomplete for sixth and seventh grade because we have not completed the benchmark. They're testing next week. Eighth grade uh, math uh, has gone up 10%. So that's very encouraging uh, because remember our high students are in um, algebra in eighth grade. Okay, so English, this is where I'm gonna have to explain the, the English one. Um, because this is a little deceiving. The English test was changed last year, so we're not comparing the same test at this point. And across the state, the scores dropped in English. Even though they took away what they thought was the hard thing, the open short answer response, uh, the scores dropped. So we are just, uh, but you know, if you look at it, if you compare the benchmark to last year's star, we're about the same. So hopefully with the, you know, the tutorials and everything that's happening, the big push, that will continue to go up. English is the one across the state that's stayed the hardest. It has the, pass, the, the, the highest passing standard. Here's our English two. Once again, we have the scores. That, uh, on the benchmark, if you compared it to last year's star, they're ahead, but if you compare it to last year's benchmark, they're not but the two tests are complete different test design. Does that make sense? Okay. Last, is last year's benchmark, did it reflect? It, it was the old test, the old style of test. Not in, but the, in the, the 17 star was the new style? The test? new style test. Mm -hmm. So that's the yeah. reason for the mm -hmm. decrease there. Yeah, during the middle of the year, the state decided they'd change the test on us for the third year in the row. And uh, even though it was supposed to have been easier, that's why people were a little frustrated. They took away one of the writing components. It, it was just hard. We weren't, across the state, we weren't ready. And here's our algebra. Now, a lot of the algebra teaks have not been taught at this time, uh, and I am not exactly for sure the same comparison date of where the benchmark was, but uh, you know, they brought it up a lot between the benchmarks, and I'm sure we're gonna bring that algebra up also. And biology. Now, this is really, this is the highlight of the high school, I'll just say. This is, many of these teaks had not been taught. They'd been introduced through a warm up spiraling, and they had 90% of their students pass that benchmark. Mm. So, biology has really been working hard. And uh, I, I can't say this enough the professional learning communities and the instructional coaches that have been allowed to work with our students have made a great impact on our instruction. Uh, and then we have history. Now remember last year, history, we did really great, 86%. And on the, they didn't, this is another one we don't have a comparison, because last year they gave a midterm only based on what they taught the first semester. This time they did the complete benchmark. So many of these skills that they were tested on the benchmark this year had not been taught at this time. You also had a lot of turnover in that department, didn't you? Mm -hmm. But they're doing really well. I mean, like if we look at their unit tests and their, you know, their shorter tests, the, the, the history department's doing very, very well. So that's just an overview uh, of sort of a summary of where we're at. And uh, I'm very proud of uh, our teachers and our students. And I tell you, I bet you could go to any campus right now and talk to any student and they would tell you what their personal goal is. Goal setting is really, uh, you know, um, we, we know some of our kids are going to struggle, but if they can improve their star based on the year before and they can keep that focus, I mean, we've got to be proud of the work that they're doing. So thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. President. Yes. I'm sorry, Tristan, I have a question. Did you have a question? Yeah. Okay. I want to point out there's, there's a, these high stakes tests we're talking about. This is a performance indicator, not a learning indicator. There's achievement, what you know, and that's what you show. Some of us know more than we can test out of. Right? And so let's encourage our students to not focus on the test score as much. It's what they're really, really learning. And the idea of growth is, is very important to talk about. Uh, these aren't designed to help us look good. They're not. They're not designed to help us look good. When you start changing the standards in the middle of the stream, uh, that's on purpose. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but, or, you know, but sometimes you wonder. <laughs> I've been at this for a long, long time as well. But again, just don't, don't, don't confuse achievement and performance. Our kids know more than they can show in the test because sometimes they, just, they don't test well. Or the test format just does not, when you have these extra long reading passages, 
And math is not calculation as much as it is reading comprehension. So, so let, let's, let's encourage our, our staff and kids by understanding what this is all about, first of all. Thanks, sir. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> any, any other questions? We'll now come to Ms. Robin. Student nutrition update. Good evening, President Irvin, board members, and interim superintendent Fraley. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about economically disadvantaged, and y'all see that on your scores and star testing and all that. We say EcoDisc. What does it mean? Well, it means that income at the, the income of our family is below or at below or at the poverty federal poverty line. An example of that is that a family of four makes less than thirty-two thousand dollars a year and is expected to live off that. So. Our district is, 70, is currently 82% free and reduced. So that tells you a lot. 66% of our, of our students receive some type of uh, assistance through the federal government. So I have a program that's going to help us help our students all the way around. And I'm hoping I can figure out which one to go. Okay. So I'm going to introduce to you what CEP, which is Community Eligibility Provision. And it's um, when USDA is concerned about economically disadvantaged students, they're concerned about their food insecurity. So what does that mean? A lot of our kids are in food insecure situations through no fault of their own. So CEP is USDA's answer to allowing districts that have high uh, poverty rates to where they can allow all students to eat meals free district wide or, or, or school wide, but we're going to go with the district. It's part of the Healthy Free Hunger, Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010. As y'all have heard that be talked about a lot, this, there was a lot into that um, law. Districts must have an identified student percent of 40 percent, and we're at 66 percent. And ISP is determined by direct certification, and that is the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, SNAP, also known uh, currently as uh, was passed to food stamps, the temporary assistance for needy families, TANF, homeless, migrant, Head Start, foster care, and Medicaid. Medicaid is just getting to be used this year in Texas, so that helps 500 of our students qualify. Um, it, it eliminates applications for meals. We have to come up with an alternative income survey because our PEAMS data will suffer if we don't do something. I mean, that's where, the, that's where your, your challenge will be. It's based on our current numbers. All meals will be federally reimbursed at the free rate. So that, that will be extra income to our, our department. But it has to be good for everybody, not just us. It eliminates our charge issues for our students. Currently, we're at $11,000 in unpaid charge of debt. Um, because, the, you know, it, just because they don't qualify for all those programs doesn't mean that they're not hurting in the family, even if they are making a decent wage because other expenses come up. So that's what our children are faced with, that their basic need of eating is not even being met, possibly. Um, so that's kind of there. The benefits of CEP, well, that all students will be able to receive a reimbursable breakfast and lunch at no cost to them. That's every student in the district. Families will not have to fill out the detailed application to use to determine the benefits. They'll have to, there'll be another form we'll have to come up with. The district will not have unpaid charges. And the printing costs will go down. Currently, we are, we're doing a five-page front and back for the application process that we have. The district will just have to go to a two-page document so you can explain to the parents the importance of filling that application out. And you'll be able to target who you have to send that to because once we give you a list of the qualified ISP students, they don't have to fill out a form at all. So our challenge is, is we have to make sure that the comp ed, Title I, and E-rate funding do not decrease. Because as you know, those numbers are based on your free and reduced percents in the district generated by our free and reduced lunch applications. And I've talked with Lisa, and we've, we've decided that that's probably not going to change on our, on our income for those things. That we must find an alternate way to identify the economically disadvantaged students for the PEAMS accountability system. Many districts are already on CEP, CEP, so they've already figured it out. So we're just going to partner and try to figure out how we're going to how that's going to look for us. TEA does have a sample of that income survey. Um, 
The bad thing is, is the new student nutrition department cannot pay for the printing or processing of the income because our program no longer needs them. It's not us that needs that information. So that's one of the, the challenges that we will have to come back. This is information for y'all today, tonight. We're gonna come back to you in April to, to actually get it approved. But I wanted y'all to have time to, to kind of think about it before we make a decision. So those are the challenges. So the timeline, we have to inform you all about it today in March. <coughs> We're gonna bring it back for approval in April. We're gonna notify TDA in May. We could actually wait till June, but we don't wanna wait till May because they've gotta come back out and do a, a mini, uh, mini audit. Um, to make sure that all our numbers, because we don't want to year, wait till year three to get an audit and find out that our numbers were wrong. Um, so in July 1st, that will start, it'll be a four year cycle, unless the district decides to end it. So if you're not locked into it for the four years. But at this point, if for four years, we would be good. And that is what I have to present for you today. Is there any questions? I, I have a question just in regards to the income survey form. Are those you say you're not being able to print them. Do you have to get those? Where do those come from? Oh, the district will print them. I just can't pay for them out of my fund. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> and how how extensive is that? Well, that form is actually a lot a lot less intrusive than the one we have to they have to fill out currently for the free and reduced <coughs> lunch application. It just pretty much says child's name, how many in the household income and you can even uh, the sa sample at TEA has it has a, a you know from this range to this range right. and then you go you, you do that that's good thank you so. Ms. Thacker I'm extremely excited about the concept of being able to provide all of our children lunches be it you know a, a financial issue or simply I forgot to bring my lunch money today or my mom didn't refill my account uh, you know making sure our children have, have the basic needs of, of uh, access to food at the school is extremely exciting to me and I applaud your effort even though there are challenges to be faced in making this transition I applaud you for for taking this head on for the benefit of our students well thank you very much and that's what it's all about is our students well, I, I will say though from a principal standpoint that's that state comp money and that title one money is essential and for, for a district like us that is the icing on the cake and we you, we got to make sure that that uh, that we we don't reduce those numbers because if we uh, from an instruction standpoint trying to live without state comp money or uh, I can guarantee you all the technology that you see in the school system in our school system does not come from local funds they're coming from Title I money and state comp money. Well, and I'm, I'm feeling reassured by her statement there are other districts doing it, and so oh, yeah, we, can, I'm, I'm we, can, we can follow in the, in the footpath to, to get the data that we need to still qualify for those programs. Oh, I'm, I'm all for it. I just I just got to make sure that that doesn't get... The important part would be for our parents to understand the, the um, how important those uh, income the income uh, survey will be. It's kind of like the language survey is just that they that they would need to fill it out and be honest honest about it because you know if they really need the help they really need to help and that would be important for them I, I to can foresee do. our social workers are going to get real busy. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, I, and just just so we're clear and I should have shouted out to our social workers. <laughs> Because our social workers help us tremendously. I, I, we couldn't do our job without them, so thank y'all. Uh, because they do go out and help us secure some of these applications when the kids are, are not able to, to eat and they're charging and we're, we're getting them to go out and check on the, do a, you know, checking on it and getting us an application if the child actually qualifies. So they're already kind of working hard there. But our principals work hard too when trying to get those applications. So they've got a little bit of work too. But did I understand you correctly that the range of income will be, it'll be in a range. It won't be, say, do you make 40000 do you make 50000 We can make it the, the we can make it be the range as long as the range was, okay. it makes it without. So they can say that, they can check a box that says the range or, and then they have to sign it. And if they don't want to fill it out, the, the signature says, I do not wish to provide this information, even though I know it will hurt my school. <laughs> I mean, that that's how TEA actually has it. Can you make it to where every kid has to fill out a form? That way you know you'll get a higher percentage. Even the, even the, even the, since everybody's got a, 
you got to get it. You could almost make it to where every kid had to fill out a form. Huh? Well, we'll have to work on that, but I will tell you <laughs> that, you know, you could, you could, I mean, but you're going to be working harder to have to touch every, every piece of paper when you only, truly you'll only have a thousand kids that you'll need to fill out, have a fill, have fill out that form based on the numbers today. Because we'll still get our numbers from the state. So, you, so you can target that. I can't target it to, for us. It's a us. little bit of a stigma for that kid to have to bring that piece of paper back. And if everybody fills it up, then every, every, if everybody fills out a piece of paper, then that kid doesn't have to send that piece of paper True. Back. We can do it that way. I mean. <laughs> Thank you. We will try. This is the time which the board has set aside to receive citizens' comments. Individual wishing to address the board should have already completed a form located on the table by the entrance door and turned it in prior to the meeting. Comments will be kept to a maximum of three minutes. Groups of five or more individuals having the same concern shall have a single spokesperson for the group. The board reminds each speaker that this open forum is not the time or place to bring the board complaints about a particular program or a particular employee. The board has adopted specific complaint policies and specific procedures for presenting those complaints. <clears throat> the board cannot respond to the comments in this open forum, but can inform you <coughs> of, policy, of policies and complaint procedures available under board policy. <clears throat> Forms will be um, considered on a first come, first serve basis. The speakers need to address the board from the podium. It is important that the board members hear our speakers uh, according to please withhold applause and any action that would be disruptive to the process. Total time allotted for this portion is 30 minutes. Mr. Michael Martin will keep time for us and I will call the speaker's attention should that time expire. We now call for Mr. Zimmerich. It's Mr. Fraley, correct? Dr. Fraley? Uh, not, not doctor. Not doctor? Okay. Just got to make sure I say it right. Good evening, President Irvin, board members, and Interim Superintendent Fraley. My name is Charles Raymond Zamonic III, but everybody just calls me Z. I teach 8th and 6th grade science at McMichael Middle School, where I also serve as the uh, department head. I am excited to speak to you today about the unique and innovative things that we are doing at McMichael to meet the needs of our students and prepare them for the future. As a science department, we have started to take a hard look at our curriculum and teaching practices. We want to provide our students with both a transformative experience and a salad, sal, salad, solid foundation for the future. Okay, to do this, uh, we will be looking to incorporate 21st century skills along with our traditional curriculum. By enriching the curriculum, we look forward to more student-led instruction and an increase in student achievement. One of the visions for our department is that every science classroom will create a learning experience that requires student engagement, communication with others, and active learning every day. Thanks to the leadership on our campus and the dedication of our teachers, I am sure that our uh, vision will come to fruition. Uh, to achieve that vision, of course, we've taken on a number of large projects. To start our seventh grade team, which includes Ms. Jones, Coach Ford, and Ms. Eddins have elected to take on the challenge of hosting a science fair. Last year, our students did an outstanding job at applying the skills they learned in the classroom by creating their own questions, driving their own learning, and supporting each other. We look forward to seeing what our future scientists have in store for us this year. While we do not have a date finalized, we invite members of the board, district administrators, and community members to attend, and we'll make sure that once that information is down, we make it available to you. Our sixth grade students are just finishing up with their rock cycle. Uh, students led their groups on expeditions to find rocks, and they were beyond surprised to see how many different types of rocks they could find just outside. Uh, the students in my class will begin to construct their own ecosystems and tanks, which include a variety of biotic and abiotic factors. Some groups have even made plans to include living organisms such as fish to demonstrate the carbon cycle. This type of project-based learning allows our kids to be creative and think outside the box. We try hard at McMichael to show students that although science is data-driven, there would be no breakthroughs without creativity. So we frequently remind them that sometimes science is more art than it is science. Uh, as the star test is upon us, eighth grade is going full steam ahead. I am proud of the progress that both our teachers and students have made. Currently, we are reviewing seventh grade material that will be on the test. 
Our class has just finished a unit on biology. We made pamphlets for hospitals over body systems, created monsters with long ancestral histories to demonstrate a mastery of genetics, and even solved a few medical mysteries along the way. Unfortunately for me, I would have died as my students misdiagnosed me with the common cold when in fact I had Ebola. <laughs> I, am lucky, I am lucky to teach the doctors of tomorrow, even though I suffered a deadly misdiagnosis, but I know that they will improve with time. Our science department is not alone in being innovative. Uh, the math department, led by uh, Ms. Bankston, is preparing our students for the upcoming STAR test. Students will review math curriculum in the form of an amazing race around the world, with each classroom being a different country. Uh, also, we have roughly 110 of our students that will be attending the math festival in May that's hosted by SFA. The associates department is bringing history to life uh, by role-playing the dusty days of the cattle drives. And our English students are currently writing, oh, that's my time, I apologize. I've got more, I can always share. But it was a pleasure, thank you very much. Good job, dude. Good job. Okay, Miss Jacinta Jones. Hi, board president. Uh, board members and interim superintendent Fraley. I am Miss Jones, uh, the Miss Jones that Mr. Zamanik mentioned. I am a mother of uh, four children in the district. I am also an educator in the district, but tonight I'm going to be speaking to you guys as an advocate for students. Um, I walked in the hallway today and I need to tell a quick teacher story. <laughs> Mr. Z was uh, talking to one of the students, I guess he had had some issues with in class, and so as I was walking by, I heard him mention um, about having compassion, and he said, that lady right there is one of the uh, ones that has a lot of compassion, and for me, compassion is love in action, and so I want that compassion to kind of show through tonight. I love my students, um, and I'm seeing some things that they have a great need of, and that's what I'm going to talk to you guys about tonight. Um, it is what I think uh, the whole district needs is social emotional learning, and I had no idea that this month was Social Worker Month. I had no idea you, you guys you guys were going to be recognizing them, so I think this was purposeful and intentional on a higher power because they know what our kids need, you know. Um, but what social emotional learning is, is a process where individuals learn to acquire the tools, knowledge, and skill sets to understand and manage behavior, to set and achieve positive goals, to feel and show empathy for others, to establish and maintain positive relationships, and a very important skill of making responsible decisions. Uh, some benefits of social emotional learning is academic success, and of course for us that is the desired data, but um, more than that it really is, as Superintendent Fraley said, making sure that they are really getting achievement and not just performance. Another benefit is less emotional stress, and we know with what we heard Miss um, uh, C just say today that a lot of our kids are, are having things that they are suffering through, whether it's in school or at home, that causes stress. They can't focus on their academics when they're uh, under those kind of things. A reduction in behavioral problems is also a benefit of social-emotional learning, and social-emotional learning promotes social behavior. Um, why must we consider implementing a district-wide social-emotional learning program? And I want to quote what I saw on the internet, and it just lets me know a lot of people are thinking about it in education. It says, before you can get to the Bloom stuff, you must get to the Maslow stuff. And so I want to talk to you guys about the Maslow stuff. <laughs> and I'm sure you guys already know what that is. But uh, for those that may not, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is uh, that there are some things that must be acquired for a student before they can even reach self-actualization. And what self-actualization is, is a person's... That's some good stuff. Okay. So I'm sorry I can't continue, but I would love for you guys to just con uh, consider <coughs> that we need to look at it. Uh, can we Austin respond? Sure. Yes. First, Ms. Jones, I want to uh, thank you for what you're talking about. Uh, yes, you're, sir. You're, you're exactly 100% right. Yes, sir. I really appreciate that. Yes, sir. Uh, Blooms is one thing, might as well something else. Mm -hmm. There's a search institute, uh, the Four Developmental Assets 
something to look at as well. We must equip our children yes, sir. with certain personal competencies uh, from a social emotional standpoint. Yes. And as a community, we have to model that and facilitate right. that as a community. That's right. Because if the children don't see it, That's right. um, they may not see that as valued. That's right. Thank you. All right, so I'll finish uh, maybe the next time. But uh, the only thing I'd want to say is the Austin ISD School District has a very successful social emotional learning. And since I don't get to uh, assign homework anymore, I'm going to assign it to you guys to go take a look at it and see what you guys think. And hopefully, we will consider it for our, our school uh, students here in NAC ISD. So, we make sure that Ms. Anderson has your contact information for me. Sir? We should we have your contact information. Oh yes, yes. You can get it for me. I sure will. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're on to something. <laughs> Miss Anna Melbrook. Good evening, trustees and Superintendent Fraley. I am Anna Middlebrook, and I'm delighted to welcome Mr. Fraley to NISD. Sir, your excellent reputation precedes you, and I couldn't be happier to have you join our school system. This evening, I would like to talk about the school at which my daughters attend, Nettie Marshall Academy of Dual Language. With many education options available in Nacogdoches, private schools, charter schools, homeschooling, country schools, Nettie Marshall has proven itself to be a top-notch elementary school and a credit to publication in our town, public education. Nettie Marshall has the highest state testing scores out of all of Nacogdoches students. Nettie Marshall is the only school in our district to improve off the PEG list. Nettie Marshall has been honored with the prestigious Blue Ribbon Award nomination. Nettie Marshall is um, in a school system with a high turnover. Nettie Marshall has a very solid retention rate with staff and teachers. Nettie Marshall implements a visionary reading intervention program which credits strong, creates strong readers for our students. And Nettie Marshall has achieved all of these distinctions while simultaneously teaching students of varying demographics to read and write in two languages. I am tremendously proud of Nettie Marshall. Nettie Marshall is a school built by Principal Bradley Durham and is continuing to be led under the wonderful guidance of Mr. Shelton Jones. I would like nothing more than the other schools in our district to have the sense of community, focus on education, and satisfaction with their children's school as we do at Nettie Marshall. I believe our town is ready to work together to learn from the example Nettie Marshall sets and to strive to offer this at other schools. I have a signed petition of over 150 signatures and dozens of letters in support of our school and Mr. Durham. We have listened to what others say about us. We have read about ourselves in the media. We have heard rumors in the public, but our view has not been taken into account. And we are request that you now give us an audience. We would like the public to know that the community at Nettie Marshall supports each other. In the past month, the Nettie Marshall parents and staff have had to sit back and listen to our school and leaders be misrepresented in the media and public. We have followed guidelines and been respectful of other people's opinions. But we know our school. We know the programs and curriculum being taught. We know the ethnicity, learning levels, and backgrounds of our students. They are our children. We know the staff and teachers. They are our family. And we know Bradley Durham. He is our leader. Mr. Fraley, I invite you to our school. We welcome you and any visitors to talk with us about the wonderful achievements of our students and teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, President. <laughs> Actually, I was, I was there this afternoon, and uh, I love Ms. Harshberger, the park pro program that you started there for, for the reading assistance. Uh, met some outstanding students and some outstanding staff there. There's, there's a real good feel there, and, and that has to be uh, permeating the entire organization and every member as well. Uh, so I just, I just, um, I'm looking at the situation. I have uh, information that I cannot share that I must consider that you probably don't have and, and you can't consider. Uh, but I guarantee you what I do is going to be in the best interest of Mayor Marshall because I, I was there today and it does feel very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. We move now to the consent agenda and that's removed from the consent agenda. All items will be <clears throat> acted on with one motion. There's a board member who wishes to discuss an item on the consent agenda separately. Please indicate the agenda letter 
and it'll be set aside for further discussion at a separate vote. Any items? If not, the board will, will not entertain a motion on our consent agenda. We'll move for approval of our consent agenda. A second. Moved by Ms. Fitch, second by Coach Fasheed. Yes. That we would approve the, the consent agenda. Is there any discussion? All in favor will show by voting. Motion carried. Thank you. Um, action agenda. Um, consideration of personnel. Mr. Mr. President, on agenda item 9A2, I move the NISD Board of Trustees to accept the superintendent's recommendation and renew the employment of teachers and other professional certified full-time contract employees as presented and discussed in closed meeting. Second. Moved by Mr. Smith, second Mr. Neal. Any discussion? All in favor? Use your sign of voting. Vote is unanimous. The motion is carried. Come to the first reading of the TASB update 110, affecting um, local policy BBB, uh, board members' elections, Mr. Michael Martin. Good evening, President Irving, members of the board, uh, Interim Superintendent, Mr. Fraley. Uh, BBB Local uh, comes from a policy update uh, from TASB, Texas Association of School Boards, uh, policy update 110. Uh, many of the revisions in this policy are just clarifications. Uh, it is tailored to our local district uh, elections and board member um, voting methods. I'd be happy to entertain any questions that you may have. This time we'll entertain a motion for the first reading. Mr. President, I move approval. First reading. No second. Moved by Mr. Neal, second by Mr. Green. Is there any discussion? No discussion. Those in favor, so by the regular sign of voting. It's unanimous. The motion is carried. Thank you so much. All right. The next item we have is um, first reading of revised uh, local policy. Um, Mr. Martin. Thank you, President Irvin. Uh, on page 273 of your board book, uh, this policy is being revised to, res to address student privacy concerns. Uh, should a student bring a tracking and or recording device to school without notifying the principal? These, the uh, administration recommends the board approve the first reading of revision <coughs> of local policy FNCE local as presented. Okay. This time we entertain a motion to that effect. Uh, uh, make first reading. Make a motion the board approve the first reading <coughs> of revised local policy FNCE as presented. I second it. Motion by Mr. Green, second by Mr. Fasheed. Is there any discussion? All in favor, show by the regular sign of voting. Motion carried. Thank you, board. Thank you. Make a motion that we adjourn. So, so moved. <laughs>